In this mini tutorial we're going to learn about Fermat's principle and in particular how we can apply it to the law of reflection of light. We need to start by asking what exactly is Fermat's principle and in order to find that out let's look at a website, a very familiar website to everybody I'm sure and see what they have to say about it first of all. As usual they have quite a lot to say about it, some of which is very important but a lot of which is well beyond our needs. But what we need to see is actually contained in this first bit here. So let's try and make that a bit clearer for you to read. Okay. Fermat's principle, or the principle of least time, is the principle that the path taken between two points by a ray of light is the path that can be traversed in the least time. Or in other words, what it says in this box here. Now, how is that going to be useful when it comes to the reflection of light? Well, let's first of all get rid of our little principle here. Just make it a bit smaller. Get it out of the way. We're going to look at having a mirror. Here's our mirror. Let's have a point S1 where our light can begin. And a point S2 where it will end up. And we're going to say that our ray of light has to cross between... S1 and S2 via the mirror. Now you and I already know that the law of reflection will be obeyed. In other words, the angle of incidence on the mirror should equal the angle of reflection. And from that we can figure out the path that light would take. But we're going to step back here and we're going to ask why it is that light does that. How does Fermat's principle lead us to that conclusion? To do this we have to let go of our preconceptions. You kind of know that what ha will happen with light is it will do something like this. But why doesn't it do that? Or why does it not do that? Why does it not even do something like this? Well, that last one involves light not travelling in straight lines, which Fermat's principle can also explain. But let's leave that out of it for now. Assuming light does travel in straight lines, why do we know it will be such that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, roughly speaking? Well, let's use Fermat's principle to find out. We're going to need to start by setting up some parameters. Let's call this distance here sorry for the lack of straight line, we'll call it A, and we'll call this distance here B. We'll call the horizontal distance between S1 and S2, this distance here, capital L. We're going to allow light to take any path it wants from S1 to S2, so long as it strikes the mirror once and it travels in a straight line. So here's a general path that you know already does not obey the law of reflection. But that's absolutely fine. That's what we're going to try and prove here, that light will end up obeying the law of reflection. And let's call the horizontal distance at which the light strikes the mirror there, x. Okay? Well, we're now going to need to find an expression, a mathematical expression, for the amount of time it takes for light to travel down this path. And that expression will depend upon x. We then need to find a way of minimising the time as we vary x, and that will tell us which path in particular will take the least time, and hopefully that's going to come back to the law of reflection. So, looking at this huge diagram overall, let's try and figure out what the time will be for the light to travel down the path shown in red. In fact, at this point, you should pause the video and try to figure that out for yourself. Well, did you pause it? Did you have a go? I hope so. Whether you managed to or not, we're going to go through how you would have worked that out now anyway. So apologies if you've done it by yourself, but I'll try to be quick in trying to show you how we would do that. In order to do so, let's make a little bit more room on this screen by getting rid of a few things. Well, let's move that over there. And let's take this particular object and move it up to here. Now, in order to figure out the time taken to traverse by this overall path in red, we need to know what the time taken for each part is. This part first of all, then that part there. Well, this part here is just the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle whose other two sides have length A here and will have length X here. This part is the hypotenuse of a different right angle triangle whose other two sides have length B there and length L minus X there. And doing that, I hope you'll realise that the expression we can start to write down for the time taken is this. T equals 
the square root of a squared plus x squared plus the square root of b squared plus in brackets l minus x all squared the whole thing divided by c because what we have there quite clearly is this part here is this distance this part here is this distance add the two distances together divide by the speed of light to get the time that it will take now once you have that expression the question then becomes how do we apply Fermat's principle to this well the point is we just chose an arbitrary point x along the mirror at which the light bounced off and here's the time it would take if light did take this particular path but what we want to know is which of the different paths it could have taken i.e. if I varied x and left a, b and l exactly the same which would be the path with the least amount of time now you should already know a way in mathematics of minimizing or maximizing an expression this is an expression for t in terms of the variable x because a, b, l and c are all fixed numbers in this so if we now differentiate this expression for t with respect to x and set that derivative equal to zero so we have dt by dx equals zero then by doing that we will find the turning points of the function for t in terms of x in other words the maximum or the minimum of this function and in this case we can see by inspection without having to do much more complex maths that it will be a minimum because obviously if I let x go all the way over here so that the light did something like this that would clearly take longer than the light doing something like this so whatever I'm going to find is going to be a minimum because I could let x go infinitely far away from here and it, wherever I put it, there'd always be a place where I could find it taking longer time by making x even further away. So this won't have a maximum as a function, it will only have a minimum. So the task you now have is to try to differentiate this complicated looking expression for t. Remember please that a, b, capital L and c are all constants. Okay, And all you will need, although it looks quite complex, is the function of a function or chain rule for differentiation to differentiate this. Please do have a go at that. In other words, pause the video now as you try that. Again, I hope you had a go at that, but let's have a look at the sorts of things you should have got. So here is our time function in terms of x, and here is what we want dt by dx to be equal to zero. What you should have got for dt by dx is this expression here dt by dx equals 1 divided by c, that's the denominator of the whole thing, it's a constant so it stays outside, times x over the square root of a squared plus x squared minus l minus x over the square root of b squared plus l minus x all squared square rooted now just stop for a moment and see if that is the expression that you got it may not look exactly like it's in this form but it should be mathematically equivalent to this if you didn't then you need to go back and try that differentiation again and if you're really stuck getting that differentiation right you need to ask your maths or physics teacher to show you how to do it using the chain rule So what do we do now we've got here well we're going to set this equal to naught and then see what that leaves us as our condition for x for this to be the path that takes the least amount of time now again to make things simpler now you've got that let's take it well out of the way and put it over here and I hope that you can see that by asking that dt by dx is equal to naught as we said over here to find our path of least time that actually we're just going to ask for this term in brackets to be equal to this term okay or written out in other words we're going to be asking that x over a squared plus x squared square rooted is equal to l minus x over b squared plus l minus x all squared square rooted 
Now, this is an important equation, because let's just stop and take stock of what we've done. We've let light go from S1 to S2 via the mirror, taking any old arbitrary path whose distance, horizontal distance from S1 was x. We found an expression for the amount of time that would take. We then differentiated that expression, and we got this. And setting that equal to naught, we got the condition that x must obey now this equation. If x obeys this equation here, in other words, whatever value of x satisfies this equation tells us the exact point on the mirror that the light has to go through for it to take the least amount of time to get from S1 to S2. Now comes a moment of ingenuity. Let's think back to what we're actually trying to use Fermat's principle for here. And what we're trying to use it for is to prove the law of reflection. So, I'd like you to pause the video and try to see if you can spot how this expression here gives us back the law of reflection. If you get stuck, don't worry, I will help you again. But pause the video now. Did you manage it? Well, let's find out how we'd go about proving it just in case you didn't manage it. And there's no shame, it's not an obvious thing to spot straight away. But let's just see what we would do. And for that, I'm just having to make a little bit of room on the board, as you can see. I need this to be a little bit smaller, because we need a bit more room. Let's shift it up here. And actually, I'm going to need this to be much bigger again, just for a moment. If I put that there, then what I'm now going to do is I'm going to draw a normal on here, which is what you would normally do if we're talking about reflection of light. And further, if we're talking the language of reflection of light, we would call this angle here the angle of incidence. I might call it little i. I would call this angle here the angle of reflection. I might call it little r. Now, why have I labelled those? Well, hopefully, if you look here, you will be able to see that this expression is nothing more than the sine of the angle i, because x on the top is opposite to the angle i, and this expression, a squared plus x squared, square rooted on the bottom, is the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle, of which i is part. So in other words, looking at this right angle triangle here, we have this expression being the opposite over the hypotenuse, in other words, sine of i. Likewise, this expression here, L minus x over this, well, L minus x is that distance there, or equivalently, this distance here, which is opposite to the angle r. This expression in the denominator is this hypotenuse here. If you need to st stop the video to just think of that for yourself in your own time, that's fine. But in other words, this whole side here is the opposite divided by the hypotenuse for this right angle triangle of which r is a part. So in other words, this expression has now simply become sine i equals sine r. Okay? Well, that's it. We're virtually there now, because if sine i is equal to sine r, then one possible solution, the most obvious possible solution, is that i is equal to r. In other words, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. That's it. You've got there. You've got to the law of reflection using Fermat's principle. Now, before we recap what we've done here, I should make the point that talented mathematicians will spot that this solution, or rather this equation here, has an infinite number of solutions uh, because sine is a periodic function. However, to a physicist, it's now blindingly obvious that I equals R is the solution that we're after. Whether you knew the law of reflection before or not, try to think of what it would mean if um, I was equal to R plus 2 pi radians, or 360 degrees, for example. Okay, so this is the solution we're after, and we're there. So as a quick recap, what you have done is you've just shown that the law of reflection, which you've known for a long time, but perhaps never really questioned why it exists, follows naturally from requiring light to take the least amount of time it can in going from two point, from one point sorry, to a second via a mirror. So we've kind of explained the law of reflection by using Fermat's principle. The next obvious question is hopefully, well, why does Fermat's principle hold? How does light know which path will take the least time? And in order to understand that, you need to Again, ask your physics teacher or perhaps read the excellent book by Richard Feynman called QED. 
As a task for yourself, it would be good to see if you could prove Snell's law for refraction of light, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, using Fermat's principles and uh, a similar setup to what we've done here. But that's the end of this mini-tutorial, and I hope you've learned something from it.